Very good morning to everyone. My name is Patrick Tay. Oh, sorry, forgot there's a mic. Yeah, I'm uh, currently Assistant Secretary General for NTUC. Yeah, um, uh, NTUC has uh, become slightly more relevant this year uh, because of COVID-19 and a lot of things that we've been very busy with. Uh, in fact, I, I oversee a few portions. I, I head up legal and strategy, but at the same time also overseeing a few of the unions and sectors. So one sector which uh, I uh, work very closely with is the financial sector. Of course, you all know financial includes banking, insurance, asset management, and now, in fact, I'm in the midst of Singapore FinTech Festival, just launched a FinTech survey report uh, yesterday. So, uh, and also, uh, Executive Secretary, okay, sounds uh, a bit odd for those who are not familiar with uh, unions and uh, labour movement. I'm also Executive Secretary of the Banking and Financial Services Union, of which ACTS is one, one of the, our professional chapters. So, so that's why uh, this affiliation and uh, that's why I'm here too. <laughs> uh, so we can't, I can't reject Sing T and, and the ACS, <laughs> ACTS team and they invite me, you see. So I'm here this morning to uh, share my thoughts in the next hour or so with uh, each and every one of you. Um, because I'm, I'm quite uh, in touch with what's happening in the labour market and uh, what's happening in the economy. Uh, for for, the, for the not so good reasons, uh, in a way. Uh, because the eight, past eight, nine months, been busy helping with many retrenchments, layoffs. Everything that you read in the newspaper, I, I, I either have a finger or a hand or a leg inside. So, so that's, uh, that's uh, what I've been busy with. Uh, but, uh, but, but more importantly, it's uh, also to uh, today's opportunity is also to update you on what's happening in the labour market, uh, what I'm seeing and what's being reported. Sometimes may not be synonymous, uh, and of course, uh, what's what's what lies ahead in 2021. So um, that's a bit of, a bit of background on uh, what I've been doing and what I look after and uh, why I'm here and also. Uh, what I hope to share in the next hour or so with each and every one of you, so you can take back something with you uh, and, and benefit from it. Yeah. Feel free to ask, I don't know if you have a question time yeah. later. If we have, uh, feel free to ask any difficult questions which you have. <laughs> yeah, I will try to answer them yeah, to the best of my abilities. But otherwise, uh, yeah, it's great to catch up with many of you. I'm, I'm glad that, that uh, ACT is organizing this because uh, it's, it's important to stay connected amongst uh, not just like-minded, but amongst the professional community in this space. Very, very important. I think um, gone are the days where we, we, uh, you know, we do things in a solo manner. I think collaboration, uh, industry networks such as this, totally important and vital. Can't emphasize more, really, uh, in my work with uh, many of the uh, different sectors, industries, as well as um, the professional uh, community. Uh, very, very, very essential and important. Yeah. All right. Thanks, 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 brother Patrick, uh, for joining us. Uh, and I, I think it's important for us to be engaged with, uh, you know, the uh, government agencies, uh, the labor unions, and of course, uh, institutions like NUS are uh, helping us to actually upskill and all. So, um, so we have heard uh, brother Patrick take. Uh, so he has actually that a bit of a self introduction here. So this video will be uploaded on our ACTS uh, YouTube channel. Great. Yep. Hi. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, let, let, let me just ask a couple of questions. So first of all, you know, probably you can share about your role as a labor union and what actually excites you and what is actually uh, the relevance yeah. now for, especially during this yeah. period. Yeah, yeah I, joined, I joined NTUC in 2002, something like 18 years ago. So I'm still in the same job. I'm a lawyer by training, actually. Uh, I wanted to go into practice and then... Uh, and then I, I, I knew some people in the NTUC and they said, you know, why don't you join us? We need someone uh, with some legal background to help workers and advise unions. And I kind of gave it a shot. Lah. I said, okay, well, why not I, 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 I join you and, you know, and, and take a look at what, how I can contribute. And uh, I, I thought I'd be there for maybe a year or so, but uh, here I am, 18 years in the job. Uh, I think what keeps me going is uh, the fact that we, in, in, you'd be surprised. Actually, there are a lot of things happening behind the scenes. I mean, perhaps some of these things that have happened, the exciting stuff, don't get reported in newspapers. But there's a lot of things happening behind the scenes. Working closely with tripartite partners, regulators, uh, employers, uh, to overcome many, many difficult problems. Yeah, I, I, I can't emphasize more. I think that maybe three takeaways. Firstly, a, a lot of negotiations go behind closed doors. 
Um, so I get to negotiate with uh, different people from the HR leads all the way to the CEO. So sometimes you get, you get a bit schizophrenic because uh, if you deal with a company where there's a lot of foreign workers, for example, you have to interact with the foreign workers all the way to the CEO. So it's kind of like a, uh, a shift no? yeah, in, in dealings with uh, company by company, industry by industry. So I've been exposed to a few industries and uh, they've kept me on my toes. Yeah, from, from, I started off shipbuilding and marine engineering during the better years. Then uh, private security, then healthcare, and now financial sector. So uh, it, it, I've seen the whole range, the whole spectrum, uh, from the very foreign worker, heavy, low wage worker centric, essential worker kind of uh, arena, as well as now a very professionals managers executive space. And I've been very passionate about this space, uh, the PMETs. That's why in the last uh, decade or so, you have seen um, the Singapore Employment Act opening up uh, to cater to more professionals, managers, and executives. Uh, in fact, there's no salary limit now for the whole of the Employment Act, just amended to the last year, effective 1st April 2019. And uh, of course, many of the changes uh, to help level the playing field. Uh, I don't know whether you've seen some of the videos or short clips of me in action, but uh, I've been quite passionate about this piece called the Singaporean Core. And that's something we hope to do in sector by sector, industry by industry. Um, that, that's uh, something that I've been championing for uh, and, and uh, keeping me reasonably, reasonably busy and excited. Uh, the second area is, of course, uh, heading up the legal department in, in TUC. Um, I, I, I never knew I had to appear before a high court judge again. Uh, <laughs> I never knew, I, I thought I would left practice. You know. But in the last 10 years, had the opportunity to, to represent some of the unions and union members involved in some contentious and more complex, uh, we, call them we call it industrial arbitration court. So when workers in the company, uh, or should I say the unions and workers, have a deadlock in management in every company, a unionized company, uh, they have two routes they can take. Firstly, to go for industrial action, means going on strike. In Singapore, we have a unique, uniquely, unique setup called the Industrial Arbitration Court, which, of which the president is uh, uh, Justice uh, Chan Sing On, the one that heard the Party Liani case. Yeah. So he's famous for that case, of course, now. But otherwise, he presides over that. And then there's a tripartite panel. It's employer representative and, lab and the labor union representative. So things that can't be sorted out and uh, gets deadlocked at the Ministry of Manpower goes to this platform. And it's held in a court uh, format, uh, like uh, it, it's, it's usually done in court 9B, 9C, uh, right on top. Rare opportunity to go there because only the Court of Appeals sits at, at that court. So uh, I've, been, uh, I've been there like more than eight times in the last eight, nine years, so it's exciting. Uh, didn't win all cases, maybe win about 80% of the cases and maybe the other 80% lost. Uh, but
this. Uh, it, it's, it's really a big change in mindset, so not easy. So we are working very closely to see how we can uh, upskill them and I think more importantly, changing the mindsets. Uh. Yeah. Yep, that's good. Uh, so I think it's important for the hearts and minds you know, to actually uh, adopt technology, embrace it. And I, I think after this workshop, I think most of our members and attendees are probably have the mindset much more open to embracing tech. So now I turn to the uh, one of the top concerns on many of our heads. Um, what are your observations about the labour market, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic? Yes. Uh, if you look at the labor, latest labour market uh, figures, there was an employment uh, report that came out last week. Uh, there's another one coming up to flesh out the first three, first nine months of the year. So it's been a roller coaster of sorts, a downward roller coaster. Yeah, uh, but the first three months wasn't very accurate because uh, we didn't really got uh, hit that. Prior to Chinese New Year, it was still you know celebratory mood. Uh. We didn't expect the impact of uh, COVID-19 to be so uh, massive. So I think after Chinese New Year, the thing started to look very grim and it went downhill all the way. Of course, circuit breaker is the, the downtime. In fact, because of circuit breaker and because of our heavy reliance on trade and movement of goods and services, uh, we are impacted in more ways than one. So we saw a, 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 a double-digit decline when they came out with the sec, second half figures and then the third half figures, uh, third quarter figures came up uh, not so dismal. Yeah, from double digit to single digit, about negative five. So I think we will end the whole year. Yeah, I, I'm not giving uh, insider information, but uh, we are, we are, I think we'll probably end the whole year negative for sure. Yeah, looking at what we are seeing. Uh, but we hope, uh, you know, looking forward next year will be better. So that's on the economic front. Uh, but on the labor market front, again, first three months, uh, not so, not so, uh, massive uh, a layoff, numbers were still quite manageable. But when you went to the second quarter, it became bad. Yes, it became bad. How bad it is? For the first half of uh, 2020, it was about something like 11,000 retrenchments. Or, uh, retrenchments, uh, I, I must caveat that retrenchments. Uh, I'll, I'll explain a bit shortly why uh, it looks is, is more than meets the eye. So 11,000. But if you look at the entire of 2019, it was 10,800. So you can imagine, first half of the year already covered the whole of last year. So in a way, it's a record. Uh, well, we always, uh, MOM is always comparing with uh, the 03 SARS as well as the 0809 Global Financial GFC. They are saying that uh, as of last week, the figures is not as bad as then. Uh, but I think it's, it's, uh, it's still, we are not out of the woods, lah, put it this way. We are still in recession. Labor market is still not looking good. Yeah, for a variety of reasons. Um, so there's a lot of anxieties and fears of companies as well as uh, of workers. Yeah. Uh, earlier I mentioned about the caveat, you know, 11,000 laid off. But remember, it doesn't count those where your EP, SPAS, work permit not renewed. It doesn't count those who are not re-employed, they are beyond 62. It doesn't count voluntary term, uh, or you've been terminated, or uh, for various reasons, uh, including performance. Uh, it doesn't count uh, for those who resign. So you can imagine, uh, you'd be surprised. Uh, I, I've actually quite a number of uh, residents who came to me, or in fact, union members. Um, you know, during January is the usual month that people kind of like, oh, I, I shall leave my job and take a break, you know? Uh, and then I'll find a new one after March. Because bonus, a uh, year-end bonus, so they get it and then they, they, they give a one month or three month notice and lo and behold, when they want to resume looking for a job in April, uh, it was circuit breaker period, so tough times. So a lot of them uh, are in this uh, so-called lose-lose situation where they were expecting to take a break for say a month or so because they've been working extremely hard long hours in the last couple of years and you know after bonus maybe take a break. But uh, lo and behold, none of us realized that, uh, the magnitude of this entire pandemic. So that therein lies at the ground level some of the challenges and concerns. Um, but otherwise, uh, up to third quarter, we are, we are still looking at uh, large numbers of layoffs. Um, unemployment numbers, uh, again, you have to see the whole year. It, just by seeing the first nine months may not be truly reflective of what's happening for 2020. Uh, but my ground sense is that uh, 
I think most employers are doing, uh, paying a watchful eye to what's happening ahead, in particular 2021 and beyond, um, paying close attention to what's happening. Uh, quite a number of companies have held back major investments, which is why it has uh, you know, resulted in ramifications across other professional services sector. So everybody is very cautious now. Um, unless you are the digital bank uh, that, uh, or you are supporting the digital banks uh, recently as of announced last Friday evening. But otherwise, uh, things that are not in, in extremely high demand, everybody is holding back and watching what's happening, whether the vaccine will come out and air travel. And uh, till today, uh, I mean, I'm not committing on behalf of CAG or CAS, but I think Year on year, today we are like 5% of air travel compared a year ago, exactly a year ago. So they can imagine the magnitude of it. And uh, it has a lot of downstream effects on different sectors. Yeah. If you look at it, uh, the five uh, badly hit aviation, aerospace, hospitality, tourism, and, uh, and retail. So these five actually have quite, uh, have taken very, very big hits. Uh, in fact, if uh, some of you may be aware, I, I hope, None of you know people or have friends who have been impacted. Uh, for the first half of this year, we have record number of uh, insolvencies and bankruptcies. Yeah, record, uh, I think not just double, not just twofold. I, think I, I haven't watched the latest figures, but definitely more than twofold compared to last year. So, so it's challenging. I met many of them uh, over coffee. That's why I said I have been meeting. I, I always uh, get excited when I hear uh, good news, like you know, when I go fintech fest or in the financial sector, slightly better. I mean, not, not that you are fantastic, but uh, the three, the three uh, bright sparks uh, under modern services will be financial, uh, ICT, and of course, professional services. So, so far, these three. Uh, so I suppose all of you are in a way professional services, and I hope uh, you are still staying afloat. But otherwise, most of the other sectors are quite impacted. Uh, we all know there are some bright sparks at the end of the day, or thanks to all of us, yeah, I, I, in tongue in cheek, um, some bright, brighter spots would be like f &B because we can't go to Japan anymore, right? <laughs> we can't go to Taiwan, so we go to the nice Japanese restaurant to fulfill our travel dreams. You know? <laughs> yeah, and eat that sashimi or eat that uh, Taiwanese uh, xiao tzu or whatever. Or, or, or uh, because you stay at home so much, mm. you buy more furniture, lose pieces. So our furniture friends are surprisingly uh, a bit better. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Either you're order, ordering it online or you're visiting some of their, their, their showrooms. And the third one is consumer electronics. I think uh, everyone is working from home, so you want that ring light, you want to look good, look good sound good, and uh, maybe enjoy more Netflix with a nice sound bar or you know, <laughs> some wireless speakers and stuff like that. So actually, these few sectors have gone up quite a bit. And e-commerce has shot to the roof. Uh, therefore, if you look at the latest FinTech Fest report la, yesterday, uh, that we roll out. Uh, there are a few reports that came out. Uh, a lot of the first, shall I say, the whole of uh, this year, because of e-commerce, um, electronic payments was the main powering piece in fintech space uh, in, the, in the last nine months. So that's one big piece that came out. Uh, so I expect, because of what's happening, uh, looking beyond in 2021, there will still be a very cautious, very uncertain outlook by most companies, other than those that have already planned their investments and in those few growth areas, those that support digitalization. Um, well, from, I mean, I see on the EDB board and uh, EDB uh, just released that this year they met all their investment KPIs. I mean, that's one good news um, because that's important, at least we are not that bad, you know, where everybody withdraw. Besides Dyson, everybody else withdraw. But Dyson withdraw this, but then they reinvested in something else. So that's, uh, and I, I see a lot of uh, focus on, um, most of the MNCs that are supposed to be here are already here. Yeah, so if you look at it, there's a lot of investment on startups, uh, as well as the tech companies, a lot of, in those three sectors, which I, I told you all about. And uh, of course, uh, this next normal, has brought in a lot of focus on new areas, for example, like sustainable farming, uh, urban design, uh, renewable energy, because of the environment and gender. And, and of course, now with uh, uh, supply chain has taken a new meaning. 
altogether uh, very, very important now to ensure that we have a constant uh, and smooth supply chain and logistics facility. So these are some of the sectors that are doing fairly okay. Moving into 2021, I don't expect myself to travel freely still, at least for a good first six months of the year. Yeah, so we are not expecting uh, you know, free flow travel. Not because of Singapore. Uh. Singapore, I think, uh, fortunately, except for the Seoul Garden last week, <laughs> but we have a kind of out of the woods uh, in that sense. So we are managing numbers coming in. There's a lot of analytics going on. <clears throat> we are managing numbers coming in. And uh, we hope, we hope really that, uh, that uh, air travel will gradually resume. Yeah, because we are, I mean, the world is flat. So we are very well connected. So uh, we, are, we are very mindful of opening up. You can imagine we are looking at number of numbers we are allowing to open up or to come in. Vis-a-vis -vis number detected positive cases. So you see updates is always important now, right? Yeah, because everyone that comes in goes through the, the rapid antigen test. If not taken it, I've taken it twice. Yeah, it's, it's okay. La. It's not that bad. It's just a bit ticklish and uh, uncomfortable, but other than that, it's okay. Um, and, uh, and, and the countries are not looking good. I mean, you hear America, I was a bit, I mean, I nearly fell off my chair yesterday when I read newspapers on the numbers in America. Uh, we have Hong Kong going for the fourth wave and uh, therefore the bubble has been burst. And, uh, and of course, uh, things are, they are happening. Uh, so, so, so MOH and the multi-ministerial task force is watching this very, very closely because we want travel to resume. Yeah, we want travel to resume uh, because it has ramifications downstream on the various sectors. Yeah. So that's uh, in a nutshell what's happening. Uh, and of course, uh, what you expect to see in 2021, a lot of uncertainty and caution. Although investments will still be coming in, maybe data, as usual, the data centers, innovation R&D uh, facilities, and maybe a bit more uh, steep investments in sustainable farming. And, and of course, uh, Anything that is do with digital uh, will be important in supply chain as well. Yeah, so thanks, thanks for sharing that. And I, I think all of us are aware of the interdependence, interrelated uh, industries, how everything cascades down because of COVID and how it's important for us to actually be aware of the threats and also the opportunities. So now next, right? Um, now since you are here, I will want to tap as much as I can. Uh, what would be your advice for PMEs? What should we do? How yeah. should we prepare ourselves to take, yeah. take uh, advantage of these opportunities that are coming? Yeah, I realize, I always say you, you better stay ready, relevant, and resilient. Yeah, according to the three R's, not re, uh, you know, reuse, recycle. <laughs> uh. yeah, some of us parents will know uh, our kids uh, will go through that. Uh. Yeah, but, uh, but ready, relevant, and resilient. Yeah, what is ready? Ready with the new skills. Uh. Because I, I alluded to earlier, Everything is going on. Whatever that can be mechanized, digitalized, and robotized uh, will eventually be going that, that route. So you, you may not be a deep tech person, but you, at least you know the capabilities and know to find the people to do it for you and uh, to work with. Uh, so so uh, to be ready, the skills and the knowledge very important. Uh, keep abreast. Uh, relevant, of course, relevant to the new jobs. Uh. Um, you hear many reports from the World Economic Forum reports to many other reports that are coming out from the different consultancy companies. Yeah, including some reports are done by some of you, I suppose, uh, with a lot of inputs. Uh, that uh, many areas will be disrupted, many jobs will be transformed. So you you probably need to, as fellow professionals, uh, need to be uh, relevant to those jobs. Nah? As in, uh, you know, be able to fit in in those jobs. I think very very important. And finally, resilient because it's going to be up and down as we can see from uh, what's happening in the last nine months. Uh, generally down, but uh, well, there may be uh, new opportunities, so you have to search them out. So that's in general. But I thought specifically after interacting with many of the uh, different professionals, managers, executives in the last uh, eight, nine months, helping them look for opportunities, at the same time also hearing their different challenges. Uh, I think uh, uh, one, I recently did a survey because I'm co-chairing this PME, team, uh, PME task force together with the Singapore National Employers Federation. We just did a dipstick survey. Maybe I should extend the survey to all of you as well. 
Uh, not bad. Within two weeks, you got 3,000 respondents. And it's quite a long survey. Wow. Eh? It's uh, about 30 questions or so. I did it myself too. And uh, I was, okay, in a, in a way, a lot of PMEs are looking for, we, we, inter we interviewed or the, the respondents of all of varying ages, varying levels of hierarchy in varying industries. So no, no, uh, it's not corrupted data. It's not a chosen sample. It's really random. No? You just go through friends and then just circulate by WhatsApp. So I, I was quite surprised. Two things came up quite a lot. Uh, career progression for PMEs came up quite a lot. That's what they aspire to when they want to land their jobs. Second is actually uh, a work-life balance. I don't know if it's uh, consistent with this group. Maybe you all are the... Uh, no, no, like I said, those are aspirational things, huh? uh, what they hope to see more of. Lah. Yeah, uh, career progression as well as uh, work-life balance. I mean, that's what PMEs in general hope to see more of. Uh, not that you all have work-life balance. Huh? Uh, I know in Singapore we are a bit overworked, particularly the PMEs. So, but uh, having interacted, with, this is just a sample, but having interacted with many of uh, our PMEs, I think including those who have lost jobs and looking for openings. I think very important, as I alluded to, the three R's. But over and above the three R's, I think um, staying in touch with uh, the practice or the professional community or your industry network, very, very important. I can't emphasize more. Um, yesterday's uh, FinTech Talent Survey report, which as uh, Singapore FinTech Association, as well as my union, as well as PwC, we just uh, released the findings. Uh, a lot of the employers are looking for people or hire people because of word of mouth and because of industry networks and associations. Very seldom you send by email and then you probably get a... Very rare. La, rare. Low, low numbers. Uh, I know some of you are also hiring, hirers or hiring managers yourselves. You usually want the uh, word of mouth or referral. You feel a bit more comfortable. I mean, uh, I see some of you nodding your heads. It's usually like that. So therefore, industry networks are very important. Uh, e events such as this, I, I find is perfect uh, so that you all know each other in the community. Uh, I know many of you are corporate treasurers and co in, the, in the corporate treasury line of business or in the finance line of business. Good to stay within the, the association and the network. Very, very important. Uh, I can't emphasize more. Uh, someday in, or some point in, in time in your career, in your life, you probably need some advice or some uh, kind words from uh, uh, from fellow practitioners or uh, professionals in the community, uh, in whatever community you're in, uh, whether it's corporate treasury or in any function, um, financial sector, uh, even in the hospitality industry, I just met up with the Singapore Hotel Association. They're, they're actually quite close, quite a close-knit group of, uh, of uh, association where they work very, very closely together and look out for each other in the hotel and hotel and f &B community. So it'll be interesting. You'll be surprised. Uh, industry networks, uh, don't, don't, don't uh, I can't underscore the importance of having uh, good links in the, your, your professional networks, i.e. Uh, the industry network. Yeah. Over and above being on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah. So if you want to expand your community, you can add me to your LinkedIn. I will set all LinkedIn connections for only today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that you have, up, uh, you, up, have, you have access to my uh, 13,000 network. Yeah, I, I will do a service to all of you as part of this. <laughs> yeah. So stay connected. Yeah. So stay connected. Uh, and, and, and I usually, you can, you can tell, same thing is on my LinkedIn. So I, or some of you already on it. I, I try my best to provide very contemporaneous information on labor market, what's happening and uh, useful things that I come across. Uh, I don't, yeah, thankfully for LinkedIn. Uh, my Facebook a bit more, I wouldn't say whimsical, but yeah, a bit more generic stuff. But, uh, but otherwise, LinkedIn, I usually pump up all the professional stuff and, uh, and, and useful information and whatever that's, uh, I feel will benefit fellow PME. So I, I try to make it a point to, to, to give you by the second, by the minute, yeah, sometimes faster than the media uh, to, their, to their dismay. So I promise that I don't be so fast. Otherwise, they will be out of job. <laughs> yeah, <You're a> disruptor. <laughs> exactly. So that's what the journalist says. Sometimes 
Well, some of us are, are, are very into it. I'm not your own area of speciality. It could be any, any of you, no? But because you, you are so intense into it, when everything's happen, you tend to be faster at it than the media where they have so a whole plethora of information and they discover it depending on the editor's assignment and stuff like that. So some, you'd be surprised some of us actually have a, a very useful. So I think it's a good platform. Not that we want to uh, enrich uh, LinkedIn, but I thought it's a good platform to at least uh, you know keep. If you don't have any network, start with that. Lah. Yeah, and then at least you know what's happening and uh, who is who and where, and uh, so that you can press the right buttons and drop the right messages. I've been quite ob obliging. Lah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, some of them who drop me a message on LinkedIn got quite surprised when I when they say, "Hey, very well, you, uh, you free for a chat? Lah. I need to consult you something." Then the next thing I know, I said, "Okay, lah, okay." Lah. Tomorrow I have a 10 o'clock free, why not you come by and, and uh, come by near my office, we have a coffee or something like that. Then they met me and then they post on, a, on their Facebook separately. They say, oh, I'm surprised, I didn't know he will bother to even <laughs> call me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Occasionally, not all the time, yeah. Uh, occasionally. Yeah. You chun chun, you hit the right slot uh, when I'm available, I'll try to accommodate. Uh, and also uh, cross share some views and just doing my small bit to help fellow PMEs. Uh. Yep, thank you. And I think uh, I can't say it any better. It's very important to connect. So one of our C's for ACTS is to connect. Oh, good, good. Yep. And uh, another good reason for you to become a member of ACTS and of course the NTUC as well. Not the supermarket, but the labor union. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> right. Well, well there's, there are supermarket benefits. If you drink wine, uh, it's uh, some good discounts on Saturday. <laughs> I, I, I look at some of the places, I suspect some of you all drink wines here. Yeah. You'd be surprised. That's another industry. Uh, I, I, I mean, I'll do on camera. Alcohol and sales have shot up tremendously in the last nine months. The alcohol companies, uh, the beer and the liquor, the wine spirits, are uh, laughing to the bank. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lockdown, nothing to do, right? So, happy hour, yeah? And uh, my friends who run uh, watering holes uh, tell me that uh, happy hour has started at five. Usually, people knock out at work at seven, right? So now it starts at five, yes? Anyway, home, <laughs> home, yeah? <laughs> So just do my clear my meals until five and then and then uh, enjoy the the job. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'll open the floor for questions. Uh, any burning questions? Please um, a mic for them. Hello, uh, my name is Grace. Thank you for your um, insights. Just want to check earlier on you mentioned about building the uh, Singapore core. Mm. Um, can you maybe elaborate more and share like what kind of yeah. measures? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Thank in you. fact, yes, uh, more than happy because I've been that journey. Yeah, on and in and outside of Parliament, uh, it started, the journey started in 2011. I think there was a the point of time where we, we uh, there was a severe, shall I say, a uh, lot of local foreign tension sentiments. Yeah, I think uh, not not peculiar to or unique to Singapore. It's everywhere in the world. Uh, we see it in America. We see it in Europe. Uh, we see it. I mean, in fact, a big part of everywhere in every country. So uh, in a way, there are, there are two, two key things uh, uh, that uh, w why we are pushing for a Singaporean core. I think, in fact, the companies that come in, they set up shop in Singapore, they are quite passionate. They said, uh, in fact, if they can, they would hire a base of uh, locals uh, in whatever jurisdiction they operate in. For obvious reasons, they want sustainability, they want local knowledge, they want people who, are, who can connect the people in that jurisdiction. So it's not you. It's not new. Uh, of course, in Singapore, we are ra rather small. Uh, if you are not aware, the government policy has always been one third, two third. We call it one third, two third rule. Yeah, one third is foreign manpower, two thirds local manpower. So that has always been the, narr the message and narrative uh, for the longest time. Yeah, and and uh, we are trying to maintain that. Not easy to maintain that. You'd be surprised. But of course, this year the number of uh, this year is a not a good reflective year to, to use. To gauge because we lost a lot of work permit holders because of the border closures. Um, so the sharp drop in numbers are uh, unique to COVID-19. But otherwise, on the whole, we've been on that journey to strengthen the Singaporean core. Uh, even in EDB, there's a big drive towards trying to find, the, to build the next wave of uh, local uh, manpower to fill the gaps. Because in all the industries, they are sprouting, or should I say, growing into, as I alluded to earlier, Financial, ICT, professional services. So therefore, there's a lot of, uh, in fact, EDB has been working very closely with the institutes of higher learning, including uh, um, 
all our universities and polytechnics to design programs to cater to the upcoming investments or the companies that are, they are or the skills that we are in big shortage of. In fact, prior to COVID-19, Singapore, we have a big structural unemployment issue. If you see any unemployment, whether it's 2% when it's good times, it's always because of structural unemployment, meaning, meaning uh, essentially, there's a mismatch of skills. Meaning we have that X number of jobs, but we have X number of people. Technically, they should be able to fill all those jobs, right? Or there are more jobs than people. Uh, but because they don't have the necessary skills, or should I say not yet have the necessary skills, uh, therefore we have this structural unemployment numbers. So that's a big challenge. So that's why we wanted to strengthen this. In some sectors, I, I wouldn't mind saying uh, publicly about it. I've been saying publicly about it anyway. Financial sector, ICT, professional services. Ironically, the three growing industries are segments, are sectors which we see a disproportionate number in, in that sense of the word, disproportionate. So, so therefore, since 2011, a series of, uh, after a series of lobbying, certain, certain measures have been put in place. Uh, in other countries, it's called labor market testing. In Singapore, we call it the Fair Consideration Framework, effective uh, in 2014. Uh, for the benefit of those who are not familiar with the Fair Consideration Framework now, before you can actually uh, take in someone with an employment pass, you need to advertise on the National Jobs Bank, or should I say that now it's called the My Careers Future Portal. Yeah, for 14 days, and, and, and uh, this, this period of time will be extended, or should I say have been extended. Uh, so that's important. So uh, that's one uh, measure uh, to help level the playing field for local uh, professional managers executives. So that's one part of it, the fair consideration framework. Uh, what it aims to, to, to minimize or eradicate is uh, discrimination. Discrimination in the form of nationality. Yeah, because uh, there may be hiring of own kind or, or own, uh, you know, uh, country mates and stuff like that. So, so we do see uh, the problem is not exploding, but there are pockets of it uh, till today we are seeing. But uh, discrimination comes in various forms, including ageism. I do come across some of them uh, in, in terms of hiring practices. There's also uh, against gender because uh, for a variety of reasons. So these are the few that I see quite often, nationality, ageism, and gender. Um, and the Singaporean call is particularly addressed to address the nationality bias or discrimination. So TAFET came out with certain rules, some travel guidelines and advisories. Uh, that's one at one level, fair constitution framework. At the second level, of course, is uh, the regulators are working very closely with uh, uh, MOM uh, is watching uh, each and every company and each and every uh, employment pass application very, very closely. So closely that uh, some of them actually uh, don't get approved and then they come to me and they're asking why, why, why. You know? <laughs> uh, and of course, they are put on the, I won't call it a knock list, but the black list, uh, where there are a list of companies. Uh, I mean, Minister Josephine Thieu has alluded to that earlier this year as well. So they are being scrutinized. And really, they are really scrutinized. I know that because some of them to their, to their legal departments come to me and say, hey, hey, how, what if I'm scrutinized? Or what do I do? You know? uh, so then I said, you have to just relook at your HR and hiring practices uh, to, to get out of the woods and, you know, and be on the green lane, so to speak. So there's various form measures, the FCF, the TAFAP scrutiny, uh, and of course, MOM at its enforcement level, looking at managing uh, uh, the inflow uh, of uh, employment passes. Uh, there's also the, the, the development bits I told you about EDB and working with the IHLs uh, to groom people with skills that are needed. So I'm glad to share that uh, NUS ComScience, I was told last year, uh, the, the applications uh, were so oversubscribed more than medicine and law, so that's a good sign. So people know that ComScience and IS are, are growth areas. You, you will also have noticed, that's why you are here today for this program, that the, the, the universities are, have all set up their CET centres because they are looking beyond fresh uh, and uh, school leavers at entrance because the numbers are getting smaller. Uh, yeah, I belong to that category during the, the days when we had 50,000 babies a year. <laughs> yeah, now I see my child, my, my son's NRIC number. Wow, this small, man. 
Yeah, <laughs> because they go by depending on which month, uh, yeah, you know, you know what I mean. Now we are like like thirty five thousand births on that thirty five thirty eight thousand. Uh, God, these are fifty thousand births. So uh, our fertility rates is record low, uh, one point one four, one of the lowest in the world. Uh. So so therefore we our line out is we can't just depend on fresh school leavers. We probably have to also uh, look at uh, our mid career hires. Uh, that's why the rollout of the jobs growth incentive uh, a couple of months back to encourage employers to take on uh, whatever source uh, of uh, manpower that they can in this period of time. And therefore, the CET centers in the IHLs, including the police, have been set up to provide uh, continued education and training to ensure that uh, if halfway your industry are disrupted, like what's happening now, yeah, aviation, aerospace, uh, it's disrupted. We can actually pivot and uh, change course to do something else. Uh, that is, because I notice most of the the employers out there, I think the attitude, the and the ability to pick up skills, uh, that's what they're looking for. Uh, gone are the days you, I mean, they all know you can't find the perfect fit, lah. Right attitude, right attitude, right capability, right experience is almost impossible. If you can find, uh, you probably don't need a headhunter, don't need to put a job ad and uh, yeah, uh, the person will probably be in your company already. Um, so, so it's not going to be easy to find the right fit. So that's where all the skills intervention, upgrading, the CET centers are here. And uh, so, so this is a long answer to your question. So there's been a lot of things that we've been doing to strengthen the Singaporean core form, the fair consideration framework from the FCM watch list, from TAFEP, tripartite advisories and guidelines including for the financial sector, we, uh, myself and uh, MAS, we came up with a special tripartite advisory for the financial services, in particular the banking sector, which is one of the sectors which we uh, are being watched closely. And, uh, and of course, uh, training the people. No point harping, harping and enforcing, enforcing, but you really can't produce the people with the right skills. Mm -hmm. So we at two levels, the mid-career hires, skill up, and then of course the fresh entrance through the IHLs. And, and, and finally, of course, uh, um, the, 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 salary ratio, the salary ceilings, or should I say entry salary to get employment passes. That's an that's a, that's a often argued topic, whether that's the right measure to do. Uh, but that's basically uh, not the dynamic panacea to the entire issue. So if you notice, it's multifaceted at the industry level, at the skills level, at the at the advisory level, at the enforcement level, at the legislative level, and, and with this salary threshold, in a way, so make sure it doesn't slide down further, and also keep up with the rise in, uh, in wages in the particular sector and in that, in that PME kind of um, job grade or occupation. So, so that's uh, in a, a long answer to your short question. So it's a multifaceted thing, and it's, it's a constant journey. Like you will, you will, uh, it's, it's not ended. Uh, you will continue to be one important area because there are often, like in any system, there may be gaps, uh, lacuna that needs to be plucked, or even uh, sometimes uh, employers who try to circumvent some of these rules and, uh, and latch on some of these exemptions. So it's important to always be at it. So. <coughs> Uh, if I may say, uh, I'm also part of the journey to, to also keep a close watch in this space. Uh, if you have any inputs, feel free to drop me a message on LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much for, for that. A any other questions for Patrick? Feel free to ask. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Hi, uh, Patrick. Thank you very much for sharing with us all the uh, useful insights. Um, as we all know, so much has happened to all of us in the mm. last nine, ten months. So I'm just wondering, um, going forward in the new year and beyond, what would you consider to be your top three or five priorities, especially towards the financial sector? I think firstly, uh, three, uh, I, I, I'm most worried about the workforce uh, in the financial sector. I, I, that's what uh, keeps me awake and work concerned. Um, because I think in the financial sector, transformation already started a couple of years back. Mm -hmm. yeah, those who have not transformed are kind of like, I won't say laggards, but have uh, not pivoted as well as those who have started the transformation process early. 
so I'm quite first thought my mind concerned about workforce. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, much as uh, we do all this digitalization, robotization, uh, uh, there may be some people who may be left behind uh, that, that entire journey. So that's going to be the tough part, uh, to make sure no one is left behind. Uh, if whoever that's left behind because of uh, not being able to pick up some of these skills, we will try to find interventions and ways uh, to, to help them segue into adjacent sectors and industries. So that's uh, uppermost of my mind, uh, to keep the workforce engaged. Uh, engaged in terms of uh, staying employed and staying employable. Yeah, you can stay employed, but if your job disappears or the company decides to pack up, uh, you must be employable. Therefore, the need to pick up the skills. Uh, second, very important, uh, it's uh, to ensure the country still has sufficient funds uh, to tide through <laughs> this. Uh, I, 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 think, I think they're trying very hard. Uh, this year, we have spent 100 billion. We are dig into our coffers and and, and frankly, if you ask any country in the world, it's not sustainable. So, um, so that's something which uh, uh, I know cabinet, including CK, is uh, very busy now, preparing for budget 2021 in February. So that's something uh, to make sure that we are still sustainable. I think there will be a lot of reallocation of resources uh, to prioritize those that are most important first. Of course, most important are our people and our economy. Yeah, I think. Uh, Therefore, there's a lot. I, I suspect a lot of reallocation of uh, budgets and stuff like that to make sure that uh, we still safe and still stay safe and secure, but at the same time also prioritize certain uh, important pieces. For example, manpower uh, and and uh, and some of the less urgent works will probably KIV, but focus really on fighting and overcoming this difficult period of time. And thirdly, I would say uh, I'm looking closely at employers. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm concerned because employers are our biggest hirers uh, at the end of the day. Yeah, uh, if, uh, if the jobs disappear, then I have more job to do, you know. I'll be busier, you know. So, so we also want to make sure that employers are, are able to, to, to leverage on some of the schemes, the programs, and of course reinvent themselves. Uh. Because I've seen, uh, as I alluded to earlier, many companies have gone become insolvent. Some sole proprietorships and even partnerships, uh, they have bankrupt themselves. So it's, it's quite sad. Uh, some of them are my friends. Uh, some of them who are, who, example, uh, some are actually travel agents who actually used to do uh, many of our trips and, and uh, they're all folded and, uh, and all in major cash flow challenges. So. Uh, it's to, to partner with employers la, to look after their workers. Because when you look after the employers, I always say, you know, uh, we are not here to divide the cake. Our rules of engagement is how we grow the cake bigger so that everybody has a bigger share of the cake. Uh, so therefore, the workforce, and of course, uh, ensuring that uh, we, as we are still a going concern as a country, and uh, to be able to ride through this difficult period, and, and the employers to make sure that they still uh, they kind of manage their cost so that they keep the job so that uh, I have less worries uh, for our workers. So this will be the three top uh, things that are on my mind uh, as we power into 2021. Uh, minus satirist variables, minus uh, all the uncertainties and, and, and uh, of course, uh, doom and gloom that you hear out there. Who knows, it might, be a, it might be a great year in 2021 if we find a vaccine and the vaccines so effective or there's no side effects and it goes perfectly smooth and uh, it reaches out to whatever area we want it to go. Um, not an easy thing, but uh, well, you never know uh, if we can. But definitely for sure, uh, it's, things are not going to go back to business as usual. Um, uh, the only good thing is this year, less of us have flu. Uh, because uh, <laughs> if you notice the children, hey, you'd, be, you'd be surprised. Uh, just, uh, I, 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 my GP friends tell me Bo Seng Lee, you know. Yeah. They say no more, less people get flu, cough, and including the children. Well, everyone is wearing masks and sanitizing their hands. So actually there's very little spreading of some of these traditional things that we usually get uh, uh, throughout the year. So actually on the whole, we are a bit, a bit healthier, minus the COVID kind of cases. Uh, people, more people are exercising and doing brisk walk. I don't know for, for what reason. Uh, if you recall, those of you who have visited parks, 
And Parks just told me last week, record number of people visiting Parks in 2020. <laughs> uh, yeah, you'd be surprised. And, uh, and I was trying to book a swimming slot in the Active SG app. Fully booked, you know. Can't find, no. So I think people are getting healthier and, uh, and uh, amidst all this crisis. And some, of course, are uh, trying to use that period of time to uh, learn some healthy cooking and at home. And uh, well, I put on some weight, though. Yeah. My weight is, second breaker, I lost weight. But after that, uh, because now the five-man room, uh, so I've been catching up people for breakfast, tea break, <laughs> coffee, lunch, dinner, supper. <laughs> All the lost time. Uh, uh, yeah. Job hazard, uh, because I'm meeting a lot of PMEs, you know, get a sense of the ground and the different industries and the challenges they're facing. So I've been uh, downing a lot of coffee. Started with uh, latte, then moved on to skinny latte, then moved on to... Uh, lesser sinful stuff, and now I'm back to double shot espresso, yeah, uh, without sugar, yeah. yeah. A any more questions for Patrick? I think we still have time for for last one. Uh, hi, Patrick. Uh, thanks very much for your talk. Can I just find out? Um, you were talking about a strong Singaporean core mm. um, in the banking sector with a lot of di digitization. Uh, using our bots, do you see that there's a strong tech core to be able to support this yes. digitization? Yes, so you're absolutely correct. Uh, of course, you heard Minister Chan Chun Singh talk about the, the uh, new tech class uh, they just announced last month, if I'm not wrong. Uh, on the, but that was really top tier uh, tech talents. But increasingly in the financial sector, what I'm seeing on the ground, and I know a lot of companies are doing, they don't want, and of course, fueled by COVID-19 and all these travel restrictions, there's a lot of focus on uh, offshoring many of these tech capabilities. Uh, you, you all know in which parts of the world. Uh, in India is very strong. Vietnam is very strong. China is also equally strong. So a lot of, uh, in fact, quite a few large financial institutions, I don't mention names, have already offshored some of these tech. They realize it's very expensive to house these people in Singapore. Yeah. So, so it's also cost, higher cost in Singapore, and it's also relatively cheaper if you, if, you, uh, if you import some of these services. So a lot of tech, deep tech talent, or should I say deep tech services or requirements are actually now offshored. So what's happening is that they have a Singaporean core of uh, project managers that uh, that's posted there to supervise the works. And of course, you need the final uh, uh, security settings uh, either back in Singapore or the final codes are done in Singapore. But otherwise, I've been seeing in the financial sector a large numbers, you know, procuring some of these services. So if you think, do things like uh, software development, coding, and as well as uh, um, a lot of the taxonomy and stuff, especially when you deal with large data uh, programs powering the financial sector, mostly is done outside of Singapore. But then the final codes and the cyber security settings are, are maybe done on shot uh, right here. So that's likely the, the what's going to pan out uh, in the future, in the near future. Uh, I see, I foresee it happening for a variety of reasons. Because of our drive towards forging a strong stronger Singaporean core, and of course, tighter EP uh, requirements. Uh, also fueled by the fact that uh, now they, many companies discover that because of work from home and remote work arrangements, actually can be done. Yeah, you don't really need the person to be physically here and uh, sitting in front of the screen to kill a bug. You can actually kill a bug off-site somewhere else if there's a very strong infrastructural link and connectivity. So that's what's happening to most of the... Uh, I know quite a few big financial institutions are doing that. Uh, yes. I know that I spoke to my friend Mr. Lee today. They are very strong in the IT programming. Mm. They have started doing it when they were when they were kids, right? So they are all go through to school. Yeah. And same as similar as India, you mentioned this, this these two places, which is very true. Uh, I think we don't have that skill set. I don't see like you know yeah. my kids grow up, uh, you know, learning programming when they were very young, you know. Yeah. So they only pick up when they are much older when they are in university where they know that it is going to, they are going to require that skill uh, when they come to the workforce. So I don't know whether government has put in place yeah. for such things to 
upskill our uh, you know uh, primary school, even from primary, primary school right yeah. upward to secondary school. So yeah, you are spot on. That's exactly what uh, MOE uh, is doing. I know because my kids are in school, one primary, one secondary, one JC, so I get a sense of what's happening. Uh, that's what they're trying to do. Uh, but also because, okay, I just turned 49 last week. Uh, so a lot of my batch mates, uh, uh, although they did comm size, I just stayed in the hostel here at Tumasek Hall for four years, uh, 25 years ago. Or should I say more than that about there? Uh, a lot of them didn't end up doing software development. I can count with one hand the number of my comm science IS friends who are still in software development. Most of them are in project, project management. Uh, most end up doing sales. Uh, so we have lost in, in, in that 10, 20 years uh, a lot of the potentially lead tech talent. So now we are playing catch up in the last five years. Uh, we have not fully caught up. We are still on a treadmill because things are changing so fast, particularly uh, programming languages and tech. Yeah, so, uh, but you're right, now it's getting better, but, we're, but I think it's the sheer numbers. It doesn't help that our fertility rates are 1.14. Yeah, uh, so in certain jurisdictions, they have large numbers. Because some of this work, especially taxonomy, you need, literally need humans uh, in large numbers to, to do this. And uh, not everyone wants to be on the screen for 12, 14 hours. Uh, it's not an easy task. So that's where the skills or structural uh, mismatch happens. Uh, but lo and behold, uh, the good news is that uh, there are more people keen to pick up some of these skills. And we're helping the mid-career ones. So actually some of uh, uh, the people I know uh, who, have, who used to do IS, CS, and I went to project management, now trying to see whether they can set way back. Because as we develop fintech companies, as we develop tech startups, uh, you need to, uh, like I said, much of the deep tech programming and development can be offshore, but you need to know the capabilities, the extent, the, the boundaries, as well as the, com the, the domain expertise. Uh. So that's very important um, to be able to cope. Uh, so therefore, creating opportunities for some of them. Yeah. But definitely work in progress. and. Uh, it's just that we don't have the large numbers that we would, we would love to have. Lah. And uh, with that limited 38,000 every year, we do uh, spread out uh, in different sectors, in different crafts, in different uh, industries. So not everybody can become tech. Uh, so, so that's the biggest challenge we have. So therefore, with these limited resources, including now human capital, uh, it's a limited resource. In fact, our local employment growth will start Going to likely going to negative come January 2024. Yeah, so that's a that's not a good sign. So therefore, there's a lot of push for digital technology robotization for this very reason, uh, not to replace humans, but to augment our work. It's, it's the truth. Uh, it's not a a myth. Uh. It's really to augment our work uh, to marry artificial intelligence and human intelligence, and uh, to make sure we propel even. And uh, to do things that they always say, uh, cheaper, better, faster, safer, <laughs> and more efficiently. Well, it is done in a way. Uh, we zoom, zoom here, and uh, MS teams here and there, Webex here and there. Um, we realize that actually we don't have to travel so much. But it also costs per tick. Like, I'm also having zoom per tick. You know? well, uh, it's like after one hour, you next one, and then now you're packing everything on the same day. So uh, it's not easy, especially you're operating in various jurisdictions. You are still on Zoom at 10 p.m., 11 p.m. Yeah. Yep. So, any last questions? If not, uh, allow me to ask the last one uh, yeah. on behalf of all. I think, uh, what would be your advice, mm. single advice for those who are actually disrupted by this uh, COVID pandemic, those who have either lost their jobs or those mm. who feel threatened and feel very pressured because of all these things that are happening? Okay. So. I, I talked a lot about skill sets. Uh. I also mentioned a lot about mindset. So both both are equally important. Yeah, both are equally important. You need the right skills to minimize the skills mismatch. At the same time, also you need the right mindset. Uh. Uh, just like many of you, I see are, are hirers yourself. So you want people in the right mindset. Uh, so it's very important as we go into twenty twenty one. I'm also trying to embrace that. Uh, is to keep an open mind. Yeah, whether it's to opportunities to threats or to disruptions. Yeah. Because when your mind is a bit more open, you'll be more receptive to change. 
it will be more agile at the same time and also uh, more resilient uh, because you know that, uh, well, uh, we, we, we take it as, it as it comes. So I think it's very, very important to keep open mind to opportunities, uh, to whatever that, that's being hurt at us, whatever kind of curveballs, uh, so that you won't, be, uh, you won't fall off the cliff. So I think uh, if, if, I, if it's just one personal advice, uh, including advice to myself, is uh, keep your mind, uh, keep an open mind. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Thanks very much, brother. Patrick. Pleasure. Thank you.